Today's story is about a man who is believed to be the biggest and strongest fraudster in history, Frank Evagnale. This man got the strangest and craziest story to the point that a movie was produced about it. It was one of the most famous movies produced by Hollywood, which is called Catch Me If You Can, which was released in 2002. Frank's fraud journey began when he was 16 years old in 1964. At that time, Frank ran away from home and went to New York City after his parents divorced. The first thing he did when he arrived was to start looking for a job. He got simple jobs for several hours a day with a low income. His living was tough with the amount of money he got from this job, especially in an expensive city like New York. So he kept thinking about ways to get out of this oppressive situation. As previously mentioned, Frank was 16 years old, and he was sure that none of the people he worked for would accept to give him a raise or more money at that age. Frank looked older than he was. His height was 180 centimeters, even in school. Some of the children used to tell them that he appears as a teacher. At that time, Frank had a driving license, and the only proof of his age was the date of birth on it. So Frank decided to change the date. He was born in 1948 and made it 1938. This way he became 26 years old instead of 16 years old. Then he kept applying for the same jobs that he used to do before, but now, his salary has become much better because he changed his age. And this was the first fraud of his life. However, the income was still not enough for him. One of the things that Frank took with him when he ran away from home was a checkbook. He had a bank account that he used to keep the money that he got during the summer work. Sometimes, he used to write checks and cash them to compensate for his low income. The checks and the bank account were legal, but his friends used to tell him that he was the only person they knew who could enter a bank in Manhattan and give them the checks and cash them very easily. His friends told him that even if their checks were legal, they wouldn't be able to cash them. The journalists who wrote about Frank's story said that the fraud desire started there. At that time, he knew that he had a special attraction. The way he dressed, talked, and behaved made people trust him, which gave Frank self-confidence. The thing that prompted him to keep writing and cashing checks even after spending all the money he had and nothing was left in his account. Here, Frank began to enter a higher level of fraud. The checks began to return to the banks where Frank used to cash his checks. They were rejected. The banks took the checks from Frank and sent them to the central bank or the concerned party for processing but the checks were being rejected under the pretext that they were bounced. Most of the banks used to refuse to cash the checks, but he kept trying from one bank to another until he managed to cash his check. Anyway, one day he was in a hotel and saw a flight team entering. The team consisted of a pilot, a co-pilot, and three or four flight attendants. Frank was amazed while looking at them. He thought that if he were a pilot, he could travel and live anywhere in the world for free. And if he were dressing like a pilot, no one would refuse to cash a check for him at any bank. And here he thought of becoming a pilot. Frank says that when the idea comes to his mind, he starts implementing it immediately without thinking about how things would go or how he would arrange the small details. The first thing he thought of was a well-known airline called Pan Am, one of the most famous American airlines he decided to impersonate one of their pilots, and the first thing he had to do was to get a pilot suit. He called the company and pretended to be a co-pilot who lost his suit. They told him about the company that makes pilot suits and told him to go to them to get a new one. He went to them and was able to get a suit of his size. Moreover, he made them charge the airline company for the suit price. He convinced them that they would deduct its price from his salary, even though he did not work for them. Frank got the pilot suit, and all that was left was a pilot card. After searching, he was able to reach out to the company that makes pilot cards for Pan Am. He told them that he was a company owner who wanted to make cards for their employees, and he told them that he was amazed by the pilot cards that they made for Pan Am, the company which he wanted to impersonate one of its pilots. So, he went to the cards company and convinced them to give him samples of pilot cards that they made for Pan Am. 
He also asked them to make a card for him with his name and picture as an experiment. Frank saw the tools used by the company to make the cards and asked them if he as a company had to buy these tools. They told him that these tools were necessary to make the cards. Frank then said, as long as I have to buy the tools, let's make a card with my name and picture just to check the quality of the cards. Indeed, the company printed a pilot card with his picture and his name Frank Taylor. This was the surname that he used instead of his real name, Frank of Agnell. The card that was made for Frank was not complete and without the company logo or name on it. However, he was able to keep working on it until he made an almost identical copy of the real card, which was amazing. During the weeks that followed, Frank started to travel from one airport to another wearing his suit and his card on his chest. He wanted to get used to the atmosphere and learn about the terms and details of airports and flights in general. During this period, he continued to cash fake checks from banks. He used the pilot suit as a symbol to strengthen the bank and people's trust. So he could enter any bank and give them checks with big amounts and cash them very easily, without any problems and without being suspected. After Frank had learned about airports, flight terms, and systems, he decided that it was time for his first flight. Of course, you are asking how would he take off a plane, and he is not a pilot. What Frank did was fly through a feature called deadheading. This feature allows the pilots or the people who work in airlines, in general, to go on any flight and travel for free, so they can go to the next destination to begin their work. Of course, this is if there is an empty seat on the plane. Frank took advantage of being a pilot to use this feature, travel on flights, and live with the plane staff for free. Frank kept cashing his fake checks everywhere he went, so he had no problems with money. And because he did not stay in one place for a long time, it was difficult to track him down after the fake checks returned to the bank. They could not identify his location or search for him in a certain area because he was always moving from one area to another and from one country to another. So it was the perfect job for Frank. It allowed him to cash the checks very easily and to move from one place to another easily. And at the same time, he used to travel and enjoy his time. This fraud operation lasted for two years, during which Frank was between 16 and 18 years old. He was able to visit more than 26 countries, travel on more than 250 flights, and more than a million and a half kilometers. After spending two years doing the same thing, he began to look familiar, to the point that he was about to be exposed when someone accused him of not working for the airline company. However, his quick wit and intelligence allowed him to get out of the situation without being exposed. But after this situation, Frank became afraid of being exposed at any moment. So he decided to step away from the field little by little. And then he decided to settle down in Atlanta, which is a city in Georgia. Frank applied for a long-term rental contract for one of the apartments. Usually, when someone is about to apply for such a contract, he has to tell them what his job or profession is. This time, Frank pretended to be a doctor, and when they asked him about his specialty, he said that he is a pediatrician from California, but currently on a paid leave to complete some important research. Things were going well for a while until he heard someone knocking on the door of his apartment one day. He opened the door, and it was his neighbor, who introduced himself as Dr. Willis Granger, a child's medical advisor at Smithers General Hospital. Frank was afraid that Granger might reveal him impersonating a doctor. Fortunately, Dr. Granger was not curious, so he had no problems with him. But at the same time, he invited him to visit them at Smithers General Hospital, so he could get to know him. Frank was able to avoid this invitation for a while, but at the same time, he decided to forge a medical certificate from Harvard University, the most famous American university, he also spent a lot of time in the public library reading about children's medicine and trying to learn more about it to be ready for any situation or complications that could happen to him because of the profession he chose to impersonate. Indeed, after a few weeks, he felt he had enough confidence to accept Dr. Granger's invitation and take a tour with him to Smithers General Hospital. After this tour, 
he started visiting the hospital periodically. However, in one of his visits, the hospital director asked him for a favor. He asked him to replace one of the doctors for 10 days. He told him that the doctor had lost one of his relatives, that he wouldn't be able to attend, and that they needed an alternative as soon as possible to replace him the period that he won't be there, which is 10 days. Frank tried to evade the issue at first and said that he did not have a license to practice medicine in Georgia and that his license was limited to California, but the manager responded to him and said that he was not going to do anything during the night shift. The matter was merely supervising nurses and trainee doctors. All he had to do was to pass through a committee consisting of five doctors, and then everything will be fine and there will be no problem as he assumes the duties of the job. Frank's initial reaction was to refuse because it was a bit too risky, but Frank's nature made the challenge very attractive to him. So he agreed. Fortunately for him, the interview with the committee was light and not a real interview, as they tried to find out all the details about him, and he actually succeeded in overcoming it easily and became the doctor in charge of the night shift in the pediatrics department, and he now has 40 nurses and eight trained doctors under his control. Frank was acting according to a person who broke the rules or the traditional management style. He was giving the trained nurses and doctors the space to take their time in dealing with the patient and to act freely and in complete control without asking for his intervention because, of course, he could not deal with cases that needed real medical intervention. The 10 days were over, and the hospital director told Frank that the doctor would not come back and he asked him to take his job as a permanent job. Frank took the job for 11 months. Imagine a person who works in a sensitive profession, and he is not a doctor for 11 months, and he is not just an ordinary doctor. He is a doctor chief who is in charge of doctors, patients, and night shifts. Fortunately, things were going smoothly for a long time, until the day he was called to the emergency room. He kept wasting time hoping that one of the trained doctors would intervene and things would solve themselves. When he reached the emergency room, he found three trainee doctors around the injured boy, and it was clear that the boy's condition was difficult. Frank kept asking the trainee doctors about their opinion on the case and what they were supposed to do as if he was testing them. He did not know what to do or how to act. But when he saw the trainee doctors agreed on one opinion, he gave them the green light to act with the boy's condition, and he left the room. After this situation, and after 11 months, Frank felt that the time had come to leave the profession, especially that he began to feel guilty, and that his position could pose a danger to people's lives. After leaving, Frank decided to leave Atlanta and the state of Georgia completely and moved to Louisiana. He met with a woman he knew from the days he was impersonating a pilot, he told her that he had a certificate from Harvard University, but a certificate in law, not in medicine, which is the strongest American law certificate one can get. During his tours with this woman, she took him to a party where she introduced him to the public prosecutor assistant of the state, whose name was Jason Wilcox. When he learned that Frank was graduated from Harvard and that he currently was jobless, he told him that the public prosecutor is currently looking for young lawyers who are distinguished in their field, and he suggested that he take the bar exam and go and work with him, of course. The bar exam is a written examination that a person must pass to obtain a license to practice law as an attorney. As was mentioned, they are currently in Louisiana, so he must take the bar exam in this state and pass it to have the right to work in Louisiana. Even if he had a Harvard University certificate, Frank must pass the bar exam, of course. The bar exam is very difficult, and it is supposed that no one can pass it unless he is a lawyer. And once again, Frank was obsessed with the challenge, and he did it. First, he forged a certificate and a transcript from Harvard University, and then he studied for the bar exam with all his heart and was able to pass it. Without cheating, he was able to pass the exam that no one can pass but lawyers, all he did was study seriously and work on himself for several weeks until he felt qualified to take the bar exam, and he really passed it. Frank was of a high level of intelligence, and do not forget that he did all this when he was still 19 years old, and he went and worked in the general prosecutor's office for a while, 
until one day he met a lawyer who was graduated from Harvard University, and he kept asking several detailed questions to the extent that Frank felt that he would expose him. So he decided that it was time to leave the prosecutor's office and look for another field. Frank's next station was in Utah, and specifically in Brigham University. Frank claimed that he was able to deceive the university and convince them to hire him as a professor assistant for eight months, but the university is still denying this to this day. Of course, all these years Frank was a wanted person, and the FBI learned about him, and they were tracking him everywhere, and even Interpol were following him. Frank left America and went to Europe, where he kept carrying out his fraud operations. Unfortunately, Frank was out of luck and he got arrested by Interpol in France on the basis of an arrest warrant coming from Sweden. It was released during the period he was impersonating a pilot, during which he cashed several fake checks. After Frank had spent several months in the French prison and then the Swedish prison, he was extradited to America, where he was sentenced to 12 years in prison by the American court. During his imprisonment period, Frank was able to escape twice, but he was arrested. After four years of imprisonment, the FBI offered him a deal to get him out of prison. In exchange for helping them solve the fraud cases, especially the cases related to the checks, Frank Check's forgery was professional. He was making identical checks to the original ones in a strange way. Even the companies that made the checks themselves were amazed by the quality of the checks that Frank made, especially the management of the tools used in the manufacture of these checks required more than one person. So what Frank did was amazing, and the FBI saw it and decided to benefit from him and his skills, instead of letting him be thrown into prison for no reason. Indeed, Frank agreed and helped them solve a huge number of cases. Frank is still alive to this day, and he is 71 years old, and although the years of forced labor with the FBI are over, he continues to help them solve fraud cases and arrest fraudsters. He is currently working in the same field as an advisor and security expert for several companies, and through this, he was able to help many people, companies, and institutions, and he also managed to make a huge wealth that was worth tens of millions of dollars. And as I told you, a movie was made about him in 2002 called Catch Me If You Can. The movie was starring Leonardo DiCaprio and directed by Steven Spielberg. The movie was a huge success and was estimated to have grossed more than a billion dollars. The movie contains details and things that are not real, but most of them are based on Frank's story. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.